Uh, so I was asked if I could speak about my work. Um, there's a few people here that know that that's a dangerous thing to do because once I start talking, it can be hard to stop. But I've only got three minutes, so I'll, I'll get started. Yeah. Um, so I work on the brain cancer uh, glioblastoma. Um, so glioblastoma is the most common primary brain tumor in adults. And unfortunately, it also carries the worst prognosis. So a patient diagnosed with glioblastoma today has a median survival of, um, of 15 months. <clears throat> unfortunately, this hasn't changed much um, for several decades. And um, there's really three main reasons for this. So the first is that um, it's a highly invasive uh, tumor. So by the time a patient's diagnosed, so they've had their MRI and then they have surgery. Uh, cells have migrated away from the bulk of the tumor and you may be the most skilled neurosurgeon in the world but you're never going to get every single cell. Um, and because it's in the brain, you don't have that luxury of taking the surrounding tissue. So the idea has always been to follow up with radiation and chemotherapy, try to kill the cells that are left. And that's really the second biggest problem. Obviously these tumors are in the brain. And a lot of you will know that it's hard to get drugs into the brain. There's the blood-brain barrier and the drugs we would like to use just aren't going to get there. That's why we're stuck with drugs like temozolomide, uh, which is what we use, but it's, it's not a great drug. It just happens to be able to get to the tumor, and that's why we use it. Um, the third problem is that even if you could get a drug that you actually wanted to the tumor, um, uh, these tumors are incredibly variable. So some cells in the tumor will have a particular mutation, which may make them susceptible to a drug, but there will always be cells there that are resistant. It's, it's like bacterial cells becoming resistant to antibiotics. Uh, so what happens is that um, those resistant cells survive treatment and then they drive recurrence of the tumor. So uh, what's happened over the past 10 years or so is people have been trying to unravel what's going on in these tumors. And most of that's come from uh, next generation sequencing initiatives. So the most well known is probably the Cancer Genome Atlas. Uh, and that's, that's been really that's been really good. It's probably been one of the biggest drivers over the past 10 years. And uh, it's given us new insight into how these tumors work, but that hasn't translated into an improvement in patient outcomes. And that's really where this work uh, uh, comes in. So uh, those sequencing initiatives, they were great, but they kind of missed some important details. So what happens is uh, these tumors are made up of millions of cells and you break them all open and you take the DNA or RNA and you sequence it. But each of those cells is slightly different and when you broke them open, they were all doing something different at that time and you lose all of that dynamic information when you sequence a tumor. It's like taking one blurry picture of a tumor and then you just do it hundreds of times for different tumors. So what we're going to do is take one tumor we're going to purify the cells so they're all the same, and then we're going to synchronize them and sequence one tumor dozens of times. And this is really going to give us the first opportunity to understand what's going on inside a single cell and why are they dividing. So this is going to let us identify a rational therapeutic target. Uh, in our lab, we believe that you'll never cure what you don't understand. And I'd just like to finish by thanking the Brain Foundation for believing in that idea and uh, funding this project.